qui va à la chasse perd sa place. Donc on va commencer. Bikulli sa'ada wa sharaf, aftatihu hadihi al-muhadara wa naftatihha bi film hawla المنظمة العالمية وسيكون الفيلم أمامكم إن شاء الله شكرا Presenting the ITUD Events App The application features all events of the ITU development sector and displays all relevant information of an event such as practical information, participants, agenda documents and media. Participants can be contacted via email through the app. All documents and their revisions can be browsed or searched by title. Photos can be shared. The app features official ITU social media accounts, including tweets and blogs. The latest ICT development trends are also accessible, with data taken directly from ITUD's highly reliable internal sources. All ITUD publications, including handbooks, reports, case studies and much more can be browsed or searched. Most of the content is free and offered for direct download. The ITUD Events app, available for free as a mobile app for Apple and Android devices via the Apple App Store and Google Play and also available free as a desktop app for PC and Mac. Download the ITUD Events app now. Thank you very much. You uh, know what it's uh, demanded, so you have to download the application of ITU. Uh, I have the honor to announce the moderator of this session, uh, my friend and uh, uh, Ami, uh, Mr. Kosma Zavazava. He will be the moderator, and I count on him to catch up the delay that we have in this session. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome to this session of the World Telecommunications Indicator Symposium. We are running behind the schedule, but we'll try to reach the cruising speed in a few seconds. Uh, the composition of this panel is that we are going to open with a keynote speaker who will take about 10 minutes. And then we have got a distinguished uh, panelist whom I will introduce later. Uh, we are going to focus on the theme of this WTIS, which is the role of measurement or indicators uh, in growing the economy or attracting domestic and foreign investment. So without much ado, I would like to introduce you, uh, Mr. Guy. Bowel Guy is the founder of World Startup Report and is going to make a keynote address. Please, may you come to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Zava Zava, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, distinguished guests from uh, 96 countries, and uh, a special thanks to ITU as well as the government of Tunisia for hosting this great event. Uh, today, I would like to have a quick chat about data-driven approach to government investing and policy making. So without further ado, if somebody can put the slides on the presentation. There we go. All right, let's get started. Again, my name is Bowie. I'm the founder of the World Startup Report. In the past 10 years, uh, I've worn many hats I started out as an engineer. About 10 years ago, I worked on the first iPhone. After that, I decided to start a few companies, one of which was sold to LinkedIn in 2011, and six months later, it became the most successful IPO in that year. Using the money from my exit, I invested in a few companies, but more importantly, I used the money to fund a research to go across 29 countries on six different continents to understand what is a startup ecosystem like in every single place. And that turned out to be my most important contribution to everybody. And that also led me to the Philippines, 
where I ended up working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the Philippine government for the past few years. And I call this role the magician role. And I think most of you will understand this because you're asked to do everything with little or no money, and you want to get the results tomorrow. <laughs> so it's a, it's a magical role, but all you guys are doing it, so good job. So I would like to go and actually take a look at this topic from three separate perspectives. First, from the founder perspective, then from the research perspective, and last, from a government perspective. And as a founder, the IT industry has come a long way these last 10 years. 10 years ago, when I started, only one of the top 10 companies in the world was in IT business. Now, seven out of 10 top companies are in IT business. The entire industry has changed, the entire world has changed, and we are the future of the world. Number two is unicorn sightings. Unicorn in our industry is called uh, the companies basically that are over one billion US dollars in company value. And the term unicorn didn't even exist in 2007. But now, there are over 304 newly created unicorn companies, companies with over $1 billion in value. These are, and these are growing day by day. And personally, from a cultural perspective, that also changed a ton. Because when I started in 2007, telling people that I want to build an IT startup company, my grandma asked me, are you having trouble finding a job in America? <laughs> and now, today, my grandpa is the one that sends me articles about startups and artificial intelligence, how the world has changed in just 10 years. And none of this would have been possible without your help. You have put in billions of dollars and countless number of hours, and that's why we succeeded. And all these programs, big or small, everything counts. So as a founder of an IT startup, I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing. We appreciate it. Now let's take a look at the same topic from a different perspective. As a researcher, I look at this and ask the following question. So what is the actual impact on the success of these startups? And what is the return on investment for all of these government programs? I don't think you'll be surprised by the answers. To answer these questions, I take a look at this program called Global Entrepreneurship Week, which I believe many of you guys are participating in. It's basically a program that is across 170 different countries, uh, 20,000 partners, 35,000 events, and in one week period every year, 10 million people participate in this program. And this is the span of how wide the entrepreneurship program is nowadays. But how does that translate into successes? Well, not so much. Um, as you can take a look from this picture, most of the successes happens on the east coast of China and west coast of America. And the picture doesn't do justice because if you actually dive down into numbers, 50% of the successful billion dollar exit company are coming from the US, out of which about a third of all the world's successful unicorns are from either Silicon Valley or Los Angeles. Between China and US, they account for 82% of the world's successful startup company. And that just by the count, if you actually take a look at the valuation between China and the US, they account for more than 95% of the company valuation created in IT industry. So how does these government program actually impact the startup successes? That would be a good question. But what if we redefine success? Instead of calling success only as you know, a billion dollar company, what if we define it as you know, million dollar company? Well, we can do that too. So this is a program that I participated in uh, these last few years. It's called Startup Weekend. For a weekend, you're working together to build an actual startup idea. Uh, it's actually, I would say, the best program uh, for startups 
anywhere in the world. Right? This is something that I've uh, worked with, I've volunteered for, I'm very, very proud of this, uh, this organization. And from 2009 to 2015, there has been 150,000 participants, about 2,000 events spread across the entire world. And they had very good success rates. If you take a look, out of these 12 companies, one of them is already over $500 million. There's another one that's between 100 to $500 million, and the rest of them are about $10 million each. And all these came from only $27 million of investment. That's the program cost. And the impact is about $1 billion. So this is a success. But what if we compare it with a private industry? How does that compare? Here is an example of another investor. So this is actually my personal investor. He invested in my company back in the days. Um, out of the 19 company he invested, Lyft, as of two days ago, is worth $10 billion. Twilio is about $2.5 billion. There are a few of these that are $500 million and above, and more than half a dozen of them, like, you know, that's more than $100 million. So for a fund size of only $6 million, the impact was over $15 billion. So if you were to take a look at these government programs, like Startup Weekend, for example, they, are, they look very good on their own. But once you start comparing these to the industry standards, you'll realize that a lot of these return on investment does not look as good. Which is why a lot of these programs, like a lot of these like, you know, investors, the world's top investors, uh, are all private. Very few of them are actually government investors. In fact, I would dare to say that every country here has spent more than six, um, six million dollars on their startup program. But I would say that not one of them can really claim to have a 15 billion dollar impact. So it really begs the question for us to take a look at, you know, what is the return on investment on these programs? And the answer is yes, we definitely should look at it. And the answer doesn't come from me, it actually comes from this guy. Does anyone know who this is? No? Okay, well, this is a, uh, there's one. <laughs> so this guy, his name is John Oliver. He runs a comedy show on HBO every week. And last week, he actually did a show specifically on this particular industry, right? He examined the return on investment on all these government programs. And I'll just share two examples with you. You know, they look at Startup New York, uh, where they boast 0% property tax, 0% corporate tax, 0% business tax, and 0% income tax. It is the perfect program for startups. And all they ask in return is for you to create one job in five years. <laughs> what is the return investment is? And here's another program he made fun of. Um, it's, a, it's a program between two rival cities, uh, and then one city decided to give a tax break for another city's company to move over, and the other city decided that, oh, we'll do the same in return, provide tax break for you to come back. So between the two cities, they burned $331 million, and only resulted in 1,100 jobs, moving from one city to the other. And in the quotes of John Oliver, it says, $331 million in lost tax revenue. And think about that for a second. You can create a program where the first 1,100 people that move from, to Kansas City from Missouri will each get a Ferrari, which they could then drive around in a giant pile of $30 million set on fire. Uh, and then you will be actually more fiscally responsible because you will save the government $20 million. <laughs> so that is pretty funny. Um, and, but, and then not all the government programs are like this, obviously. But you know, the reason why it's funny is because there is a little bit of truth to all this humor. So what do we do now? 
and let me put on my magician hat. Uh, a few years ago, the European Commission actually asked me to suggest them what programs they can do in Europe to promote startup community. And I reviewed all the work they have done, and I came to the conclusion that they are not short of ideas. They have a lot of ideas. What they need, actually, is actually a way to filter these ideas to figure out which ones are the best performing and which ones are not performing. And I think the advice I give to them fits very well for the topic we have today. And I boil them down to just three simple questions that I think all of us should be asking before committing to a program. Number one, what is your goal? Uh, more importantly, what is your realistic goal? If your goal is to become the next Silicon Valley or to create the next billion dollar business, well, statistically, it is not very likely. You're much better off focusing on realistic goals like foreign direct investment, job creation, you know, tax revenue, or even publicity, if that's what's needed, right? What is your realistic goal? And the rule of thumb is be realistic. Don't just sell the dream. The second question is, what are your metrics? And more importantly, what are your heart metrics? Our industry is plagued by a lot of these soft and vanity metrics. For example, like, what is the entrepreneurial spirit in a country? What is the uh, feeling? Like, you know, and all these things, because it's debatable, it ends up being very useless it's much better off to actually look at the real data, like hard data, that indisputable data, like actual dollar amount being invested. What is your earning per dollar spent, right? How much tax revenue are you collecting? How many jobs are you generating? Right? Those are the hard metrics that we all want to see, but we are not seeing. So the rule of thumb here is, if the metric can be disputed, it's not a very good metric. Number three, how do you collect data? And more importantly, how do you collect and maintain data? Because data is not something you collect once, it has to be collected throughout the lifetime of your program. And to make sure it's accountable, it needs to be transparent for everyone to see. And to actually make people use it, you actually need to make it accessible. Singapore is one of the government that has done a great job making their data available for everybody, and I would highly encourage everyone to take a look at what they're doing. And the rule of thumb here is data analytics should be part of the program budget and not an afterthought. So uh, I will cut my presentation short and just like, uh, leave just these three questions. Uh, and hopefully the panel like, can, can carry on this discussion. So I'll repeat it one more time. It's, what is your realistic goal? What are your heart metrics? And how do you collect and maintain data? Last but not, last but not least, uh, throughout the last few years, I noticed that I've never seen a single company that built the perfect product on day one. We all have an idea, and the successful companies are the ones that obsessively reiterates their products based on the metrics, All right? Similarly, governments, they cannot build perfect programs on the first try. They also need to look at the metrics and reiterate based on what they actually see. IT startups cannot survive on their own. They need government's help. And more increasingly so, governments need IT startup support. We work hand in hand. The future is ours. It is a journey together, and together, I believe, we can build a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, our keynote speaker. I would like to come back to the panel. Uh, our panel constitutes of uh, five speakers and they are pretty much representative of uh, all the communities that either collect or use data. 
Uh, we have two speakers coming from the regulatory uh, environment. Uh, to my left, we have got the chairman of the Bangladesh Regulatory Authority. Welcome. And uh, to my right, we have got, uh, in fact, over there, <laughs> we have got um, the CEO of Tunisia Regulatory Authority. And then we also have the representative of government, the permanent secretary uh, in the Ministry of ICT from Namibia. Uh, you have the names on the web, of course. And then we have a regional telecommunications organizations, the African Telecommunication Union, who will give us a global view <coughs> on how uh, data could be collected or more cooperation could be, could be undertaken. And then finally, we have got from the National Statistical Office of Tunisia uh, a representative who is going to share perspectives. So we are at crossroads. First of all, we are trying to implement this or to achieve the sustainable development goals with the three pillars. One, economic pillar, two, the social pillar, and then three, uh, environmental pillar. And it, all these pose a challenge in terms of data collection. And I'm not going into details because the panelists are going to respond. And then on the other hand, we have got new emerging technologies that are unfolding. We have got big data. We have got Internet of Things. We have got artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and we'll be talking about 5G. So with this, we have to embrace digital transformation, not only on the part of government, but also on the part of uh, the regulator and the private sector. And the consumers have got to fit into this because they are directly impacted. So I would like, based on the presentation from the keynote speaker, to ask our panelists to respond, commenting on what they think is the critical role in creating an, invest, an investment-friendly environment through data collection, data processing. So to begin with, I would like to invite uh, the Permanent Secretary, Ms. Timbo Utaya Jarakama, Permanent Secretary, Minister of Information and Communication Technology in Namibia. And each panelist will have about two minutes, and then I will take another round and then open the floor uh, for you to pose your own questions. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning. I hope what I'm going to share will resonate the appetite, efforts, and strategies of the nations of the world, both represented here in this August be, uh, gathering and those that are not uh, represented. The magnitude of work at our disposal as ICT ministries is so achievable if we are to coordinate our efforts with the educators to inculcate into our education curricula elements of ICTs uh, from uh, pre-primary to the end of the education uh, road. We need to harness the resources that are, are never at the disposal of governments, but that are embedded at the disposal of public-private uh, sector in partnerships so that we realize both the human, the monetary, and other uh, resources, particularly expertise, uh, to, to be able to address and uh, develop uh, ICTs uh, for the men and women at the household level. There has been this question of impact, impact. But when we think of impact in the economies, we think of, firstly, of money. But money is not the, the life changer for every citizen of a country. It is the knowledge, the skill, that changes lives of communities and therefore um, uh, makes a turnaround strategy for the economy uh, of a given uh, country. We need to, uh, ICTs are a fast revolving or evolving phenomena so much that we need those that are mandated to run national programs of ICTs to be on the alert sleeplessly uh, to ensure that particularly the laying of the playing field through legislation, legislative frameworks, it's ever constantly, uh, constantly revamped, 
uh, to meet the demands uh, of the day. Uh, it takes too long, particularly for, and right, rightfully so, for democratic dispensations to amend laws and regulations uh, through consultation. But if we harness ICTs, it will enable us to fast track the consultative processes and shorten the length of time uh, to engage our citizens in ensuring that laws that need to be uh, reworked and facilitate a functioning uh, social and economic uh, spectrum in, in the country are, 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 on the, are on the table as and when they are required. I think at that I, I would like to pause. Thank you very much. I understand that uh, Mr. Edi Said, Chief Executive Officer, National Statistics Office, Tunisia, uh, will be catching his flight, I think, around 1 o'clock. So I would like to invite you to make an intervention. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sa'atakallamu al-Arabiya. Shukran jazeelan ala hadhihi al-da'wa. Wa tafa'ulan ma'a سؤالك وكذلك تفاعلا مع العرض الجيد الذي تم تقديمه سأتناول الموضوع من وجهة نظر إحصائية كممثل لمؤسسة عمومية تنتج المعلومات الإحصائية وتضعها على ذمة المستعملين لاستعمالها في أعمالهم في بحوثهم إلى غير ذلك أعتقد أنه من الأهمية بمكان لخلق بيئة خلابة للاستثمار للتشجيع على الاستثمار وجود أو إنتاج معطيات إحصائية دقيقة ذات مصداقية وتوضع على ذمة كل المستعملين هذه المعطيات يجب أن تغطي كافة المجالات وكافة الميادين الاقتصادية الاجتماعية التربوية المعلوماتية كل هذه المعلومات يجب أن تترجم الواقع واقع هذه القطاعات بأكثر دقة بأكثر شمولية لكي توفر لبعث المشروع أو توفر للقطاع الخاص للباحثين للمجتمع المدني بصفة عامة مؤشرات تترجم أكثر واقع المعيش وكذلك تستعمل لدراسة المشاريع ولتوضيح الرؤية أولا توضيح الرؤية في الماضي كيف تطورت هذه المعطيات نقاط القوة نقاط الضعف في الوقت الحاضر كذلك كيف تتفاعل هذه المعطيات هذه المخرجات الإحصائية مع الواقع ثم بطبيعة الحال لاستشراف المستقبل لدراسة المشاريع للاستشراف لمعرفة دقيقة أكثر بما سيدور في أي قطاع خاصة وأنه في الوقت الحالي نلاحظ ونشهد تطورات سريعة ومتسارعة جدا في بعض الأحيان يصعب تصعب حتى على المعطيات الإحصائية أن تتوقعها ونلاحظ كذلك سرعة التفاعلات بين القطاعات وخاصة القطاع اللي احنا بصدد دراسته اليوم قطاع تكنولوجيات المعلومات والاتصال ودورها الكبير والكبير جدا في خلق وجمع وتحليل معطيات إحصائية بأكثر سهولة بأكثر دقة بطريقة تكون مفهومة لكل المستعملين وهنا يكون دور التقنيات الجديدة هام وهام جدا خاصة من حيث دعم الثقافة الإحصائية أي كيف نقدم هذه الإحصائيات على أهميتها إلى المستعملين ومستعملين عادة ما تكونش عندهم علاقة كبيرة بالمعطيات الإحصائية 
ما تكونش عندهم علاقه بالتقنيات بالمنهجيات ب بطريقه بناء المؤشرات والمستعمل يرى فقط مؤشر وحيد ولكن هناك سلسله كامله في الانتاج الاحصائي والتقنيات الجديده وخاصه في الوقت الراهن تلعب دورا كبيرا وهاما خاصه خاصه من حيث ليس من حيث الانتاج فقط ولكن من حيث الجوده والجودة رغم أنها صعبة القياس ولكن استعمال التقنيات الجديدة تساعد على تحسين جودة هذه المعطيات وأهم حاجة وخاصة بالنسبة للمستثمرين بالنسبة للشركات بالنسبة للقطاع الخاص هي سرعة وضع هذه المعلومة لمستحقيها وهنا يكون الدور هام وهام جدا ل هذه التقنيات الجديدة ونلاحظ كإحصائيين كمهنيين في, 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 في الإحصاء أن العلاقة بين الإحصاء والتقنيات الجديدة هي علاقة تكاد تكون ميكانيكية يعني لا يمكن أن نشتغل في الحقل الإحصائي دون دون الاستعمال هذه التقنيات الجديدة دون فهمها دون تفكيك مختلف مختلف مراحلها إلى غير ذلك أي أي أن الإحصاء بدون هذه التقنيات لا يمكن لا يمكن وخاصة في في وقتنا الراهن لا يمكن بأي حال من الأحوال أن نضع على ذمة كل المستعملين طبعا إذا نحكي على المستعملين نتكلم على القطاع العمومي على الحكومة على صناع القرار نتكلم كذلك على القطاع الخاص بكل بكل مكوناته المجتمع المدني الباحثين الاسر كذلك الاسر كذلك وربما انهي هذه المداخله القصيره بالقول انه انه الاحصائيات ربما ليست في حاجه الى تبرير اهميتها في كل الميادين في كل الميادين ولكن ربما الذي ال- يجب أن-, ان ان نعمل عليه ونعمل عليه بجد وهذه دعوه خاصه الى صناعة التكنولوجيات الحديثه صناع ال- البرامج الاعلاميه ان ان يقتربوا اكثر من الحقل الاحصائي وان يوفروا اليات جديده لجمع المعطيات لننتقل من ال- من ال- من ال- الطريقه الكلاسيكيه اللي نعرفوها كاحصائيين كمهنيين في هذا الميدان الى طريقة جديدة متجددة نستعمل أكثر هذه التقنيات في كافة سلسلة العملية الإحصائية من الفكرة من من الفكرة لماذا ننتج مؤشر إحصائي ثم من الملف التقني للمؤشر الإحصائي إلى جمع المعطيات إلى تحليل المعطيات إلى وضع هذه المعطيات على ذمة المستعملين إلى لا كوميونيكاسيون معناها كيف كيف نقدم هذه المعطيات في اي شكل نقدم هذه المعطيات لكل مستعملي المعلومه الاحصائيه مع الشكر Thank you very much for for that intervention so I would like to challenge uh, Mr. Shem Bebes and uh, and Dr. Shajan Mahmoud You are, the, you are regulators, and you are on the demand side. And I think there is a challenge coming from the National Statistical Office that since the, their work is based on a multi-sectoral uh, basis, uh, there is need, first of all, for them to understand the technology, but also to cooperate with uh, the national regulatory authorities. Uh, In your responses, can you indicate to what extent you are cooperating with your national statistical offices and what you think could be improved? Please, uh, Bangladesh. Yeah. Can you uh, repeat your question again one more time, please? Okay, there was a challenge yes. uh, saying that uh, there is need, as national statisticians, yes. they would like, they obviously are supposed to collect data across all sectors. And I would like to know in Bangladesh, to what extent do you work with national statistical offices, and particularly because you are the ones who are the specialists in terms of uh, technology. Also, the technology for data gathering is also quite a critical element. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying about the demography of our country, then that will give you an idea how difficult this problem is. 
Bangladesh is a very small country in size, 54,000 square miles only, with a population of 170 million people. So that gives you an idea about the data collection, problem of data collection and interpreting. Anyway, so uh, we uh, are collecting, you know, we depend, we are, I'm making, particularly I'm making the BTRC, the regulator, uh, uh, data dependent or I'm trying to force that. I'm driving our regulator into a data driven policy maker. So before the policy was being dictated by, from the top, but now I try to collect the data from all over the country in every sector, their economy, uh, their economic uh, or their, you know, uh, belly, their daily life data. And then I try to, depending on data, I try to, in, you know, uh, summarize that data and then I, pass it on to the top for policy making. Yeah. As you said, it is true that uh, people are still unaware of the, how to interpret the data or how to collect the data. So probably that is one reason that after investing so much in the telecom sector, we are way behind in the ranking, in the world, world side ranking. Maybe we, our people do not understand how this data has to come into the ranking factor. And that is why I came in here. And we are very unhappy about the whole situation that after so much of investment and so much of penetration of the telephone, and um, you know, about 84% uh, people have our telephone. And um, internet penetration is more than half, but still, the uh, ranking of Bangladesh is way, way behind. So I will ask ITU to intervene or to inter, you know, interact with, the, with various member countries to make them understand that what kind of data has to be collected and how it has to be interpreted and how it has to get into, uh, how it is getting into the ranking factor. So, uh, thank you, and uh, I see that you know we need the data for many reasons. Uh, we we need the data for policy making. We I believe, being a data analyst for many years, I believe the data is also something that will give you the status health or for health monitoring of the policy, how the policy is proceeding. And from the data, you should also understand that if the policy is being implemented rightly or not. So if you need to take any corrective action, there also you need the uh, data. So again, um, I think uh, the time has come when we have to see the um, things holistically and bring the data. Uh, we have to make the interpretation of the data into the policy making in a regular basis. Thank you. Th th thank you very much. Uh, we have taken note of your observations. I would like to invite the President of Telecommunication National Regulatory Authority of Tunisia. Please, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I will speak in French, okay. just change languages. Okay. Uh, L'Instance Nationale des Telecommunications, uh, c'est l'autorité de régulation tunisienne. On est en étroite collaboration avec uh, l'Institut National des Statistiques. Chaque mois, on relève donc les, les, les principaux euh, indicateurs du marché des télécommunications. Donc, et on essaie de créer un observatoire national pour le marché des télécoms. Euh, donc, on collecte toutes les informations sur le, le, la pénétration des technologies, que ce soit fixe, mobile, Internet fixe ou bien Internet mobile, sur les parties économiques, les revenus des opérateurs, sur l'évolution du marché, sur un euh, certain nombre de choses. Et chaque mois, on publie euh, sur notre site web donc d'une façon transparente tous ces indicateurs là et on partage ces données là avec euh, l'INS. De plus, il y a je pense une commission nationale où euh, de où il y a une commission à l'INS où l'instance elle est elle est représentée donc on travaille en en collaboration. Donc notre objectif est d'être transparent parce qu'avoir une bonne régulation c'est être euh, transparent 
et aussi euh, avoir une régulation participative où tout le monde doit participer à, à la prise de décision. Et donc nous sommes conscients euh, sur ce fait-là et nous sommes conscients qu'on doit avoir notre Observatoire national des télécommunications parce que ça donne euh, un reflet sur ce qu'on fait sur les, et une bonne idée sur l'état du marché tunisien pour attirer les, les investisseurs, que ce soit euh, nationaux ou, euh, ou étrangers. Voilà, juste pour résumer, parce qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de temps. Merci pour, pour votre réponse. Thank, thank you very much for, for those uh, remarks. Uh, I would like to go to the Secretary General of uh, the African Telecommunication Union, and I would like to ask you one thing. If you look around the 90s, uh, the 30 plus least developed countries in Africa out of the 54 countries were struggling and most of them were below 1% in terms of telephone penetration per 100 inhabitants. Now the situation has changed, although still we see that uh, the least developed countries are still lagging behind, not only in terms of digital uh, connectivity, but also in terms of data access. Uh, we would like to know the role of uh, the African Telecommunication Union in a trying to improve the investment uh, environment in Africa and also to attract uh, private sector participation because the private sector obviously wants to know uh, the gaps on the ground and uh, the government also in formulating public policy would like to understand the situation uh, on the ground. Uh, what are your perspectives? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I think I will come back also just in French so our interpreter of French speaking can take a small break okay. uh, like the other. So, but before I want to commence, let me d'abord remercier au nom de l'Union africaine des télécommunications les autorités tunisiennes pour l'accueil dont ils nous ont toujours montré à notre arrivée ici à à Hamoud, qui n'est pas notre première visite. Je pense qu'il nous sera encore leurs invités d'ici peu. Donc, ceci étant, je voulais juste dire qu'effectivement, quand on regarde d'une manière générale les statistiques, parce que comme nous sommes en train de parler des statistiques, il faut d'abord effectivement vérifier le, le marché global africain, la pénétration euh, du mobile d'une manière générale, parce que bon, quand moi je veux dire mobile, je, je mets le tout ensemble. Bien sûr, je ne vais pas faire les détails des statistiques, mais il faut se dire effectivement euh, euh, l'Afrique a connu euh, une certaine évolution rapide. Il faut le dire, il faut l'accepter euh, dans le domaine d'éthique. Mais cependant, nous ne sommes pas encore, quand on compare les statistiques, peut-être demain on va projeter, et pas seulement les pays, mais de manière générale, le continent africain va se sentir peut-être un peu frustré par rapport au rang qu'il occupe, particulièrement dans le semaine d'éthique. Mais toujours est-il que nous, au niveau de l'Union africaine des télécommunications, bien sûr, de concert avec nos États membres, nous entreprenons un certain nombre d'activités ensemble avec notre partenaire traditionnel qui est l'UIT et puis le BDT ainsi que les autres secteurs. Euh, quelles sont les actions à mettre en œuvre pour faire en sorte que l'Afrique soit un marché toujours attractif Parce que le marché, comme on dit, il est là, mais il faut montrer que ce marché est attractif. Et ce marché ne peut être attractif que quand euh, euh, la manière de venir investir en Afrique est de plus en plus simple. Et je pense qu'il n'y a pas longtemps, j'ai vu euh, euh, les statistiques concernant le classement des, des pays au niveau mondial, comment les, les, le, 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 quels sont les, les pays les plus rapides à venir, où on peut venir rapidement faire ces investissements, pas seulement dans les domaines d'éthique, comme on avait dit tout à l'heure. En fait, l'éthique, c'est un tout aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire qu'on ne peut pas parler de l'éducation sans l'éthique, on ne peut pas parler de la santé ou des transports sans l'éthique, mais je pense que quand on regarde aujourd'hui, il y a un certain nombre, il y, a, il y a quand même un encouragement par rapport aux États membres qui essaient de créer un environnement facile d'investissement. Aujourd'hui, il y a des pays qui peuvent créer une entreprise aujourd'hui à moins de 48 heures. Je pense que la création, l'institution des guichets uniques dans beaucoup de pays, en tout cas, est 
de, ça encourage les investissements. Ceci étant, bien sûr, nous avons quelques, euh, toujours, on a des challenges. Les challenges, comme on dit certainement, au niveau de nos, nos agences de régulation, peut-être que la dynamique que nous voulons que les États puissent prendre en marche n'est pas encore à top. Donc, il y a toujours un certain nombre de barrages euh, traditionnels, comme on dit. Bon, deux fois, on s'est dit que l'investissement vient de l'extérieur. Est-ce qu'ils vont faire de l'argent sur nos dos Est-ce qu'ils vont Est-ce que nous on va gagner quoi Je pense que non. Il faut qu'on se débarrasse de tout cet aspect-là. Mais aussi, peut-être qu'on essaie aussi de créer la consommation locale. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut que le marché aussi des investissements c'est un marché local. Il ne faut pas que tous les investisseurs soient, soient, doivent venir de l'extérieur. La Tunisie aujourd'hui doit créer un, des conditions pour que les Tunisiens, les Tunisiens aussi puissent investir dans le domaine d'éthique, pas seulement dans les autres secteurs. Je pense que c'est ça aussi qui manque au marché africain. On sait que le TIC, on l'a laissé en fait aux investisseurs extérieurs. On se dit que c'est compliqué, c'est ceci, c'est là. Mais je pense qu'on doit créer aussi les conditions. Ce qui m'amène à dire que l'industrie d'éthique aussi doit avoir sa place en Afrique. Je pense que c'est surtout ça le problème. Il faut qu'on crée le marché africain. Il faut que l'Union euh, africaine qui est en train de travailler de manière générale avec les, les instances de décisionnelles, que le marché africain aussi soit aussi un marché d'éthique. On a beaucoup d'entreprises qui font du ciment, qui font du ceci, mais beaucoup de personnes de manière globale ne s'intéressent au TIC en Afrique. Je pense que c'est ce, ce retard là qu'on demande aux États africains de voir comment combler ce, ce genre de retard pour que l'éthique aussi soit une réalité africaine. Bien sûr, nous les utilisons, nous faisons tout, mais nous ne pouvons pas continuer à consommer tout de l'extérieur. Je pense que c'est surtout tout ça. Créons un marché africain. Créons des entreprises africaines. Je pense que euh, ceci va certainement éviter certaines solutions. Bien sûr, quand on dit de créer, on peut faire un partenariat avec euh, les autres pays qui en ont les moyens. Mais au moins, que les entreprises africaines doivent se sentir concernées dans le développement d'éthique. Voilà brièvement, Monsieur le Président, ce que je voulais dire. Merci. So just to come to, uh, please prepare your questions or comments after this. Uh, Secretary General, you, you are calling for uh, partnerships uh, across the board and across the regions. To what extent do you cooperate in uh, the area of statistics with other telecommunication regional organizations? Or do you see an opportunity uh, for you to promote inter-regional cooperation and strengthening of capacity in terms of data collection and processing. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I think right now we don't have exactly, I think it's always what uh, uh, some, uh, what you tell uh, uh, civil society always ask me why we don't have the African data collection when we want always the data on ICT we have to look directly to ICT, uh, ITU to see where the data is coming. And we say that normally we were planning to have a cooperation with the ITU, especially with BDT, to see how we're going to have a database for the African countries in terms of the web. Even in AUC, this project is already starting, but they're still looking where the server we're going to be and when you want to access to those information where are you going to take it we even did one workshop to see how to manage those african database in terms of the ict but yet now we continue thinking and i think next week we're going to have an african ict meeting minister so certainly this it already on some agenda we will see exactly where it's possible to have the african data base. I know there is some country who have facility to, to host it even without institution like uh, you see for example in CERT of, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia I think many uh, uh, way or looking on which country is able to host this and how ITU can help in terms of data collection only for the African countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to assure you that um, in the Telecommunication Development Bureau, uh, 
the director's vision is that the regional organizations and the economic commissions uh, access and have access to our data that we collect so that we don't duplicate effort. But then the regional organizations can use it for the analysis and provide to the membership uh, the, the results of that analysis. Can I open the floor to uh, anybody? And if you could kindly introduce yourself and the name of the organization. I see a hand over there, please. The floor is yours. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I am uh, Arif Sargana, Director of Economic Affairs in Pakistan Telecom Regulatory Authority. Uh, uh, I don't have the question, rather a comment just to add what uh, Chairman Bangladesh Telecom Regulatory Authority has already said, that uh, the ITU has done some very good job for ranking the countries for last few years. And uh, uh, we, because it, it, this kind of the work helps us as a regulator or policy makers to change our stance. Uh, but unfortunately, what we see in, in this ranking is that uh, billions of dollars are being invested in ICT sector in our part of the world. The uh, ICT usage is increasing tremendously uh, and all other indicators in the terms of uh, the ICT are increasing. But when we see our ranking in the, in the ITU, it's going down, it's going down. So, so when I further dig out this, the data behind this, uh, the ranking, I see that some of the irrelevant data, for example, the ICT education you are taking into account, which is not the part of the uh, ICT regulator. And you need to review the actual data to calculate these indexes in a real term. In this term, uh, in, in, the, in the way you are calculating this uh, development index, it means the countries like uh, Pakistan or Bangladesh or all other countries will remain 150 or 160, despite the fact they, they spend uh, how much they uh, amount in, in the ICT sector, how much their ICT sector is growing. So I think in that case, this is not basically uh, the guiding factor for us, particularly in the developing countries, to improve our regulatory and policy making. So this is just a suggestion and comment on, 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 uh, on the discussion. Thank you, sir. Yes, please, Bangladesh. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, that is an echo of uh, many countries, not only from Bangladesh or Pakistan. So let me tell you one bad side or the dark side of this kind of ranking. We depend on FDI very much for in developing our sector. So when they see this kind of ranking, it, it shows it uh, gives a wrong picture to the investor, particularly for the FDI to bring the, you know, so I suggest that you know, we look into it objectively, and as Pakistan has said, echo that it should be uh, re-evaluated or revisit the issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the issue of ranking is always uh, a contentious issue because there can't be two number ones, and there can't be 193 number ones. But having said that, uh, we long took note of uh, the concerns, of course, of countries. We are a member-driven organization. And uh, I just wanted to invite all the countries to consider participating. We have got two expert groups. Expert group on telecommunications indicators and an expert group on households indicators. That's where the relationship between the National Statistical Office and the telecom sector converge. So it is important, and when I have private discussions with uh, telecom regulators, uh, many of them confess that they don't really interact with the National Statistical Office, and the reverse is true. So I would like to encourage you, and if you need, uh, my colleagues are sitting over there, if you need to register yourself as an expert to participate in the discussions, because 
ITU does not create indicators. ITU listens to the member states, and the member states are the ones that create the indicators. And all what we do as secretariat is to implement the methodology. And as you heard from the director of the BDT, the methodology was subjected to a litmus test by an independent body, and it was found to be a sound methodology. And that body also does a sensitivity analysis on the methodology for the index on innovation, which is done by WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, UNDP, the Human Development Index. No formula is perfect, but uh, I think our aim is to try to come up with something which is sound, which is robust, and which is member-driven, and there is no benefit to ITU to misrepresent anything, uh, because ITU does not exist without the membership. So I would like to say, please do participate, and you know that we, up until now, we had 11 indicators. We held an extraordinary meeting from the 1st to the 3rd of March this year to review those indicators, to reflect the more reality on the ground, the issues pertaining to what constitutes a computer, because now they are smartphones, uh, fixed networks, and whether we should continue to measure the number of telephone lines by 100 inhabitants, uh, issues like that. And we, we are pleased to say, and I would like to thank all those governments that uh, came and participated, and all the other UN agencies and independent organizations that were part to that. So it is within your power to influence uh, all this, uh, by participating more actively. Every year we meet once, those two groups do meet, and then we also have an online forum where we continuously debate, and then you can make any proposal that you want. I think one of the issues that was mentioned here is the issue of uh, indicators for cyber security, which is one of the new topics that we'll be discussing. So I just wanted to, to, to add to that. It is in our best interest if everybody could be happy. Uh, be, because we are there to, to, to serve you. But I saw a hand uh, on that side also, uh, seeking the floor. Yes, please. Good, me good morning, Tim Pandey. I'm a director in the Ministry of Communication, Government of India. Let me, let me echo the view of expressed by Bangladesh and Pakistan. We are also in the similar stage of uh, development. India with 1.2 billion population, we are making huge investment. And the same issue, ICT ranking is going down every year. There is a challenge. There is some, something, some uh, flaw in the methodology of collection of uh, this calculation of this uh, ICT indicator index. So my suggestion is that there are countries which are very small. If they make some development, their ranking goes very high in a very uh, limited uh, investment and a very limited uh, effort. But if you see the India, the size is very big. So my suggestion is that there should be some weightage for the population also, because everything, whatever we are doing, that is divided by the population. So we, you should give, you can't compare apple with orange, okay? So, my suggestion is that there should be some weightage for the population, for the size, for the geography, while calculating this index. And secondly, I want to say the next 14 parameters which are going to come up from 2018 onwards, we have some objection and uh, that we will be sending to, uh, in the, I am also a member of EGTI and EGH, through that group, we will be taking up. But here also, we want to make point that we will be sending our views on all the 14 parameters, because it is very difficult to measure some of the parameters. And some of the parameters, which are very relevant, have been dropped. Let's say mobile subscription per 100 population. Mobile has not reached saturation worldwide. It has been dropped from the list of 14 indicators. I think that's very premature to do it. And secondly, the, uh, there is some uh, difficulty in measuring the coverage, mobile coverage by L uh, um, 3G and 4G. 
um, population covered by the mobile signal. So that is also India being a very uh, vast country, huge population, it's uh, difficult to uh, calculate that uh, coverage. Okay, so uh, I'm making only two suggestions. One is the uh, next 14 indicators should be re-looked into. Secondly, there should be some weightage for the size, topology, and the population of a country while arriving at the development text. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, India. Thank you for, for, for those comments. Uh, we are going to have a special session for the two groups, uh, work of the expert group on telecommunications indicators and also on households. So uh, please do bring up the discussion. Uh, it's most welcome. And uh, we are pleased that uh, India is participating actively in the, in the work of the two groups. And we, we, we look forward to getting your, your, your inputs. I would like to see on this side if we have got anybody asking for the floor. Sorry, two more. Uh, this side of the room. Yes, please. Okay. Bonjour tout le monde. Donc, euh, je suis euh, Mokhtar Karidjo du régulateur nigérien. Euh, donc, j'aimerais intervenir sur euh, le taux de pénétration au service de télécommunication. Donc là, tout à l'heure, l'Inde avait suggéré qu'on prenne en compte la démographie dans le calcul de certains indicateurs. Là, je suis ravi de savoir que euh, depuis cette année, l'IUT a décidé de prendre en compte l'âge des, des personnes dans le calcul du taux de pénétration. Pendant longtemps, en tout cas nous au Niger, on avait calculé le taux de pénétration à partir des abonnés mobiles, Euh, avec un dénominateur qui était l'ensemble de la population. Et lorsqu'on sait que les pays africains, notamment le Niger, ont une population très très jeune, on se retrouve avec une grosse partie de la population qui est euh, comptabilisée dans le dénominateur et qui ne peut pas avoir accès au mobile du fait de son, de son âge très faible. Donc euh, j'ai appris que dorénavant, on va considérer les populations âgé de 15 ans et plus. J'aimerais savoir si c'est effectivement ce qui a été décidé à la dernière réunion en Argentine. Merci. Thank you very much for, for, for those comments. So you, this is the diversity of our membership. Uh, but I think uh, it's important for us to dialogue openly and uh, try to find uh, solutions. Just to, 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 to mention that during the work of uh, the EGTI and looking at the methodology, uh, there has not been a direct link between the population size and, uh, and uh, the IDI uh, and the issue of topology uh, is also an issue which, which is not quite incorporated into, into, into the methodology uh, or within the indicators. But uh, I, I think there is nothing that exists that cannot be addressed. Uh, we, we are open and encouraging you to participate in the experts groups and to make uh, contributions to exchange views and then uh, uh, I'm sure we can overcome any obstacles that we may have. I would like to take another question. Uh, yes, please. At the back. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Alfred Marisa. I'm the Deputy Director General at Portras, Zimbabwe. Um, I just want to sympathize with um, colleagues from uh, Bangladesh and uh, India. We, 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 we also had um, similar issues um, uh, with um, the type of ranking that, <coughs> that happens. But um, what I can say is that perhaps we are all equally unhappy with um, the outcome, which makes it good because we are all equally unhappy. Um, this is something that is a process of, of obviously, democracy and uh, 
we have been participating actively in the uh, expert groups um, because we saw that um, that was the only way uh, to put our voice across. Um, so I think to my colleagues um, in Bangladesh and India, yes, we sympathize with you as Zimbabwe, and um, we just want to say that uh, what we did was to look at those areas where we were not doing well and focus on those uh, rankings that were poor and see how best we can improve as a country. Um, certainly, there are unique situations in each country, and the measurements can never take all the unique situations. Um, and as such, we just take this, yes, as an indicator that can help us to plan ahead uh, and move forward. And so, Mr. Moderator, all I can say is that we, we will continue to participate actively uh, in the expert groups. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for those comments. And I think when uh, the experts group uh, sit and meet uh, the day after tomorrow, and tomorrow we are going to have, uh, when we launch the Measuring Information Society report, a discussion by our experts. And they will be able to distinguish between IDI value and the IDI ranking. Uh, so th th that will come up. I would like to plead with the interpreters uh, just to give us until one o'clock. Uh, is that acceptable? Interpreters, can we go until one o'clock? Yes. Thank you very much. I would like to give an opportunity to the panelists to make their final comment, but I, I, I saw a hand right at the back. Please, if you can take the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, my name is Turhan Muluk. I am working for Intel Corporation. From industry perspective, we believe it is very important to develop indicators on new emerging technologies such as 5G, cloud, IoT, smart cities, big data, to, to foster a healthy investment climate with better data. We also need to consider the indicators on e-applications for uh, digital and digital economy related indicators. This will be also in alignment with the last WDDC, Buenos Aires resolution and the action plans. Another subject is to measure the mobile broadband data speeds in developing countries. Currently, we don't have any problem to measure the fixed broadband data rates, but more than 90% of broadband subscribers in developing countries are using mobile broadband technologies. Therefore, it is very important to develop indicators related with mobile broadband data speeds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Intel. Uh, for those that may want still to take the floor, I encourage you to raise them during the course of the uh, WTIS in uh, the appropriate. We have a variety of uh, uh, sessions this time. As you saw, we also have some parallel sessions, so there is going to be enough room for discussion. I would like to give the panelists uh, one round quickly, maybe 30, 30 seconds each. To make a comment, please, yes. Uh, I have one comment, you know. Uh, if I see uh, from our friends from Bangladesh, from India and Pakistan, I think the main problem is that uh, there is country are investing in ICT, but the ranking is down. But what we have to look is the differential, I think. It's not a static point of view. We cannot compare X to Y, but also we have to compare the effort. But I don't know, in the ITU-TD, uh, is there any indicators which calculate the incremental? So how the country invest in the system? Because it's very hard to start from zero, uh, from ranking from 90 to one, you know. But there is, a lot of countries are putting efforts and sometimes you know, it's not good to have, all after all that efforts, your ranking is down. So it's. There is something going wrong with that. So I think 
I propose or suggest that if we can have also in uh, your indicators some incremental indicators. So what has been done, for example, the difference between penetration between uh, your uh, N and your N minus one and so on. So this is the main topic. And I know that every country is uh, investing and uh, want to, uh, to improve its ranking to attract more investment and to do, you know, have, uh, you know, uh, better uh, infrastructure to show that it has better infrastructure and so on. But sometimes when you compare, uh, there is a real a problem. So we should not really compare countries, but we have to compare uh, their efforts. Uh, thank you. Th thank you very much. Yeah, we, we, we do take into account um, the efforts being made, but uh, pretty much I think most of the member states are equally making an effort. Uh, so what we have done this year was to come up with a volume two uh, of the Measuring Information Society report to reflect the reality on the ground, the progress which is being made. Yeah, so uh, this helps because it is not just, well, it is not a naming and shaming business. It is to try to report the reality on the ground. So when you read the first part, which is volume one, it is going to report on the findings and then uh, Report number two is going to report on the progress that each as an individual country has made, which we think is uh, also quite important. And by the way, the data that uh, we use is uh, validated. Uh, when we receive the data, we return it to the regulator to validate it, uh, to make sure that uh, it is the right data. So, but I thank you very much for, for, for that good comment. Secretary General, do you have any comment? Oui, je voulais juste effectivement dire que j'appuie d'abord la proposition de, de mon ami parce que effectivement deux fois, il y a des pays, effectivement, ça veut dire que quand on compare, je vais prendre juste un pays au hasard comme le Niger par exemple, l'étendue du, du pays, elle est tellement vaste que parfois l'effort fait dans le domaine d'éthique n'est pas complètement reflété par rapport à certains pays qui ont ça prend des pays qui ne sont pas comme on dit euh, 200 000, 300 000 km carrés quand tu prends un pays qui fait un million d'habitants je pense que c'est important effectivement de, le, de, 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 de faire ce point là deuxièmement ce que je voulais dire aussi c'est la collaboration entre les services statistiques que les pays aujourd'hui ont créé dans tous les ministères, d'abord, et même il y a un, un service euh, statistique, mais aussi avec l'agence, l'agence nationale des statistiques. Parce que, deux fois, qu qu on se rend compte que c'est quand les données de l'UIT sont sorties que les pays, euh, à travers la voie des presse, aujourd'hui, dans tous les cas, rien ne peut se cacher, que le président se rend compte qu'il ah, est dernier. Donc, tout le monde commence à courir, et puis on appelle le ministère en charge d'éthique pour dire qu'est-ce qui se passe, parce que les acteurs de la société civile sont par derrière pour regarder qu'est-ce qui se passe, comment nous sommes derniers par rapport au, au TIC. Donc, je pense que eh, la collaboration aujourd'hui, elle est obligatoire et elle est conseillée. Que les services de statistiques forment certaines agences de régulation parce que deux fois, ils n'ont pas la capacité humaine pour comprendre comment la collecte des données est fiable parce que c'est la fiabilité en fait qui est importante ici. Il ne s'agit pas de donner des chiffres de pénétration comme ça, mais il faut que les données statistiques soient vraiment sur une base fiable et on ne peut le faire qu'avec des professionnels. Et les professionnels, c'est l'agence des statistiques. Je pense que là, le renforcement des capacités des agences de statistiques et des agences de régulation et des ministères. En tout cas, je pense qu'elle est importante et la collaboration est conseillée. Voilà en fait ce que je voulais dire. Merci. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Let me, at this point, give uh, the floor to the Director of the BDT, Mr. Brahim Asano, and then I will come back to, to the panelists to complete. Or do you want to have the final word? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, Permanent Secretary in Namibia, please. Thank you. I think it's encouraging that we are all tuned to sharing of expertise and skills and um, we would like to encourage collaboration in terms of bilateral agreements uh, between those that have uh, gone ahead and those that are still lagging behind. At least the world has not remained static for all of us. In one way or the other, we have learned and grew wiser uh, in our, uh, through our pitfalls. Thank you. 
very much. Uh, Bangladesh, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad that, you know, we, I got a chance to speak the minds of many countries here. Yeah. I believe that a piece of validated and quality data speaks about the past of the organization, present of the organization, and also, if you can interpret rightly, it will take you, tell you about the future of the organization, where it is going. So that is why this ranking um, is very important, you know, why? That it sends a wrong signal. For example, you know, we are looking for the fourth operator, you know, we have three big operators in the country, we are looking for the fourth operator. And we have invested huge amount of capital in this sector. But when they see the ranking, perhaps they think the investor or the FDI investor, they think that probably we do not know how to manage the investment rightly. So these are the things, that's why, you know, these, these things came out from my mouth, you know, with the frustration. So I hope after this session, uh, after this conference, the things will uh, move and will move in the right direction. Thank you. Th thank you very much for, for that, Ms. Said, please. شكرا جزيلا اعتقد انه من خلال النقاش تجلت اهميه وتاكيد العلاقه القويه بين الاجهزه الاحصائيه الوطنيه او النظم النظم الوطنيه الاحصائيه وعالم تكنولوجيا الاتصالات وهذه العلاقه القويه والتفاعليه في مجال الاحصائيات وهذا اللي يطرح اشكال التعاون التعاون تعاون داخلي وتعاون خارجي تعاون داخلي يكون بالاساس بين كل مكونات المنظومه الوطنيه للاحصاء من منتجين ومستعملين للمعلومه الاحصائيه للنقاش بين ظفرين التفاوض من اجل توفير كل المؤشرات الضروريه لتوفيرها للمنظمات الدولية لترتيب البلدان وهذا أكيد وأكيد جدا يكون التنسيق داخل داخل البلد ثم في مستوى ثاني من التنسيق وهو التنسيق الدولي وهنا تطرح مسؤولية والمسؤولية الجسيمة والكبيرة على المنظمات الدولية منظمات دولية تابعة لمنظومة الأمم المتحدة وكذلك المنظمات الإقليمية وإذا نأخذ بعين الاعتبار إفريقيا مثلا هو الدور الكبير للاتحاد الإفريقي في في هذا المجال لخلق آليات وديناميكية أخرى وربما يجب استنباط طرق جديدة للتنسيق والتعاون من أجل توفير كل المعطيات الضرورية وخلق إطار موحد للبلدان لكي نتجنب ربما هذه الملاحظات اللي اللي الناجمه عن كل بلد وستبقى راه دائما وهذا نعرفوها نحن في مجال الاحصاء وخاصه عندما يتعلق الامر بترتيب دول واستعمال معطيات احصائيه ستبقى دائما الاشكاليه مطروحه أن كل الدول ستقول لماذا ترتيبي هكذا ولماذا ترتيبي هكذا وبالتالي أعتقد وكمسؤول وكمهني في قطاع الإحصاء أن العمل يجب أن يكون أولا داخل الوطن داخل البلد من خلال التنسيق والتعاون واستعمال كل الإمكانيات المتاحة من مصادر إدارية وهنا نحب نقدم شكر كبير لزملائي في وزارة تكنولوجيات الاتصال والهيئة كذلك لأننا نشتغل تقريبا بشكل بشكل متواتر بشكل يكاد يكون شهري من خلال إنجاز البحوث الإحصائية اللي ينتجها المعهد الوطني الإحصاء في تونس لفائدة وزارة تكنولوجيات الاتصال على المعهد وربما هذه تجربة فريدة أن المعهد بالتنسيق ومع وزارة تكنولوجيا الاتصال ننتج زوز بحوث بحثين إحصائيين بحث حول الأسر ونقدم كل المعطيات إلى وزارة تكنولوجيا الاتصال لاستغلالها في أشغالها وكذلك بحث إحصائي آخر حول المؤسسات ونحاول من خلال هذين البحثين أن نوفر قدر الإمكان 
كل الـ 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 الاحصائيات للمو وفي في تقريبا هناك شهر او شهر ونصف تطورت هذه العلاقه الى العمل على المصادر الاداريه التي توفرها الهيئه وصراحه عندما نستعمل البحوث الاحصائيه للاسر وللمؤسسات ثم نكملها بالمؤشرات والاحصائيات المتوفره لدى الهياكل الوطنيه لدى الهيئه وقد وقد نجحنا في هذا اعتقد اننا بدانا نشتغل على منهجيه لكيفيه مد المنظمات الدوليه بمؤشرات ومعطيات متفق عليها بين كل الاطراف المتدخله واعتقد هذه ستكون ان شاء الله في المستقبل ك... ك... كعامل اساسي لتحسين جوده المعطيات الاحصائيه لتوفيرها بقدر الكافي وربما وربما مزيد التعمق في حاجيات الوزارات المكلفه بتكنولوجيا المعلومات والمستعملين مع المنظومه الوطنيه للاحصاء نستطيع من خلالها ان نحدد الحاجيات الضرورية من الإحصائيات ولكي ربما نتجنب هذه المشاكل أن ترتيب بلد هكذا لأن المشكلة الرئيسية تكمن في كيفية جمع المعلومة الإحصائية في الحلقة الأولى يعني على مستوى الوطن وتأتي بعد ذلك طبعا على مستوى دولي المنهجيات الإحصائية كيف تحتسب شو المؤشرات المستعملة وأنا عندي ثقة كبيرة حقيقة في كل المهنيين في هذا القطاع أنه نجد ربما قاسم مشترك بين ما توفره المعطيات الإحصائية في كل بلد والمؤشرات الواجب استعمالها لترتيب الدول في هذا المجال مع شكر جزيل Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for those uh, insightful uh, points. At this point, I would like to uh, give the floor to the director of the BDT, please. Thank you very much, moderator. I feel very happy and proud to hear what I'm hearing here. This is a kind of uh, debate and exchange of view we as BDT wanted to do to give a platform for our membership to exchange views and experiences and also to build together something that will work for our society. Um, very briefly, I think that when I'm um, listening to all those debates, we may want to sit back and try to define the IDI because the idea is just an index. Like you have the GDP, like you have the Human Development Index, so like you have the NRI, all those indexes actually never go beyond a certain reality, cannot go very low in the reality. A GDP, very high GDP, never tells you how many poor are in this country and how many very rich people are in the same country. So let's not actually uh, consider our IDI as bad. No, it is the same level than those. Having said that, uh, the most important in the IDI, as I said in my speech this morning, is not the comparison to others. It is the comparison to yourself. How are you improved? And we have the indexes, the sub-indexes, and the indicators that will show you that you have improved. Maybe it's good for us, uh, who is in charge of that, I'm saying I to you and you, to give this message back to our policy, ma our, our, our policy makers, to the high policy makers, to go into the detail of what is happening in the country and show where we improved. And this is the most important. But the most important, the idea, as I said, it's a methodology, an international, internationally standardized methodology, where you can get your input and get the output. Uh, some country even, as I said, started using the methodology to make regional IDI. It is first for you to measure your progress within an international and standardized process. This is the most important. Secondly, of course, uh, we cannot compare countries like that, like all the indexes. So you have to compare yourself to countries that have got similar 
geographic, economic situation, and sometimes cultural situation. This way it's useful. If you compare yourself to a country where there is no comparison, of course the result may not, be, uh, may not help you to improve. So this is uh, what, the way I would like us to see the IDI and explain to our decision makers that it's not meant for the ranking of all the countries, it's a normal all indexes, but let's go beyond and show you where we improved. And we can follow that with them uh, as we go along. The second issue is about at the operational level. Of course, ITU, as I said, is just measuring what is agreed in the expert group. As it's important, since this issue is so important for us, let's contribute with our new ideas to the expert group to make them adopt it there and ITU will just measure. So it's important then for me that we participate in the expert group. Of course, capacity building is an issue, and we are spending a lot of money, a lot of resources, money and our, finance, our human resources on the capacity building because giving good data also in the system is so important. Again, I just want to say I'm very too happy to see this discussion here, and let's continue them because you are building something good for the humanity. Thank you. So I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sanu, for those comments. Uh, I would like to thank you all. The success of any session is measured by the debate that it provokes. And I think uh, I'm quite impressed and very pleased that I thought maybe since we were running behind the schedule, we might end up with a dull session. But uh, it has been very thought-provoking. And it has been very, very exciting, and we have taken notes. Um, I think the director summarized it uh, all. So let me summarize the session. Um, I'm pleased that we had a multi-stakeholder kind of approach, a diverse uh, group of panelists that uh, participated in this discussion, so we got perspectives from uh, different angles. One of the things that came up is the issue of capacity building, that we have to make sure that we build the capacity for data collection, and also on the other side uh, for, for all the other stakeholders. The second thing that came is to ensure that the policy framework is in place, the legal framework is almost in tandem with uh, technological developments and the regulatory framework. But for that all to work, there must be and I summarize your words, uh, there must be internal coordination and collaboration between the statistical offices and the various sectors. Because ICT is not about the technology alone, it is also about everything that impacts human life. So a multi-sectoral approach has been recommended, and we would like to ask the, our friends from the statistical domain to encourage other high-level uh, representatives to take part in this, because this is where we normally note the gap. And then another thing is that uh, I think um, it has been stated that there is need not only, and as part of the digital transformation approach, not only to involve governments and its agencies, but also to go beyond and also involve the consumers uh, to make sure that we have a 360 degree approach. And with these words, I would like to thank you very much for an active participation and to thank our panelists and please if you can give them uh, an applause before I hand over to the chairman of the, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zawazawa. It's a pleasure to hear this uh, deep uh, discussion. You gave us a very uh, heavy uh, session. You have been uh, very uh, kind and very uh, deep in your uh, analysis and in your summary. I would like also to take the opportunity to thank the ITU because they, he, or the ITU is challenging us every year and challenging the decision maker. And that's the important, that's the very important things about this indicator. It's that we are waiting for this indicator and our effort is measured and we have the challenge and that's where the ITU is really doing a great job. Also, uh, if I have to put some remarks and maybe participate in the end and uh, 
take uh, opportunity that I'm the chair and I will have the last word. So I will uh, put uh, two, uh, two uh, uh, or one uh, suggestion is that the next step is that the indication or the indicator focus on the new challenges and technology. That means I2, uh, virtual reality, uh, smart city and so on. So we would like to see our investment or the investment of countries in this area to be shown in this, in this indicator. And in conclusion, I would say that whatever we cannot measure it is not useful. So try to, uh, to measure all our decision and all our effort in developing our country. Thank you very much. The last information is very important that the, the next session is at 2.30 uh, p.m. in this uh, place and we will start at 2.30 p.m., not one minute after. Maybe we will close the doors. Thank you very much.